Hi everyone, Melody here. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Jonas Cheka's new book, How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle, Nietzsche and Marx for the 21st Century Left. For those who don't know, Jonas Cheka is the creator of the YouTube channel formerly known as Cuck Philosophy, where he does explainer videos, usually focused on debunking misinformation about postmodern philosophy and how it is often conflated with Marxism. I want to offer a disclaimer here, which is that while I have read some philosophy books, I'm not a philosopher by training. My education is in the natural sciences, and I'm currently in graduate school for economics. I have not read much of Nietzsche at all, but I have read a good bit of Marx and Marxist literature in general. So if you think I got something wrong, feel free to let me know in the comments. Just know that I'm not an expert on philosophy. Much to this book's credit, it succeeded in getting me more interested in reading Nietzsche for myself. And indeed, I did end up reading some after finishing it, and I have included some reflections of my own in this review. I also want to put forward another disclaimer, which is that I have been a big fan of Jonas's channel for a long time, so if I seem like I'm being overly critical in some places, it is primarily for the purposes of not coming across as a sycophant. Although I have a great deal of respect for Chaco's work, it is readily apparent that we have some pretty fundamentally different opinions on, for example, the legacy of the USSR, his assessment of it being rather negative and mine being decidedly more positive. I think those differences will be made apparent over the course of my review. While I don't want to dwell on these differences, I did want to at least make note of them so that my partisan leanings are not disguised. It is often through the exploration of opinions different from your own that you can attain a deeper appreciation for the subject under consideration, and maybe even change your mind about some things. One last thing. While I will be highlighting some key ideas in this book, I will not be providing a comprehensive summary. Otherwise, we'll be here all day, and at that point, why not just read the book for yourself? With that out of the way, let's take a look at How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle. Cheka opens by pointing out that, in a sort of mutual hostility, fans of Nietzsche's work tend to either be indifferent to Marx or openly anti-Marx. Likewise, Marxists tend to dismiss Nietzsche with a similar wave of the hand. Usually, this is framed in political terms. Marx as a revolutionary socialist thinker, and Nietzsche as an apolitical or even right-wing or reactionary figure. Cheka points out that while there are elements of Nietzsche's philosophy which would certainly be considered reactionary by today's standards, simply dismissing Nietzsche as a reactionary whose philosophy can be connected in direct lineage to the Nazis does a great disservice to the thinker and gives far too much credit to Nazis. As Nietzsche scholar Walter Kaufman noted about this alleged connection between Nietzsche and the Nazis, quote, all serious interpreters of Nietzsche, no matter how much they may disagree on other points, agree that this absurdity can only be supported by either rank ignorance of his work, common at one time in the English-speaking world, or an incredible lack of intellectual integrity, common to a few Nazi hacks." End quote. Similarly, Cheka comments that the Nazis vulgarized Nietzsche, proclaiming the arrival of the Übermensch in the Third Reich, quote, even when this Übermensch was characterized by two of Nietzsche's most hated things, a German nationalist and an anti-Semite. For Cheka, Marx was similarly ossified by self-proclaimed Marxists. On the one hand, by social democratic parties, who were reformists, unlike Marx, and on the other hand, by socialist states such as the Soviet Union, who, according to Cheka, used a selective reading of Marx's corpus to legitimize things that Marx himself likely would have balked at. While I don't disagree with this point as a matter of principle, I take issue with Cheka's painting with such a broad brush of self-proclaimed Marxist regimes as vulgarizers or otherwise as perversions of Marx's original vision. This does great insult to the revolutionaries like Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, and many others who triumphed in creating a truly new, if flawed, socialist order. I do not think it is hypocritical to celebrate the successes of Marxist states while also being critical of their shortcomings. This is the position I hold. 
What rubs me the wrong way here is Cheka's dismissive caricature of Marxist states as authoritarian monoliths. The whole of Cheka's book is saturated with the sentiment, so if I dwell too much on my disagreements with Cheka's view of self-proclaimed Marxist states, I will likely miss the forest for the trees. That being said, it made reading this book, at times, a jarring experience, because I'd be reading along, nodding my head in general agreement, or excited by some insightful passage, only to run into parts where Cheka disparages Marxism-Leninism or the Soviet Union in a tenor that would make Jordan Peterson blush. That was mostly a joke. Hey, you suck! Get better material! Cheka's intention with this book is clearly not to paint Nietzsche as being some kind of closet socialist or anything of that nature, but rather to draw out, on the one hand, unconscious similarities between some of Nietzsche's ideas and Marx's, such as the critique of modernity. And on the other hand, to show how socialists might be able to salvage some of Nietzsche's philosophy and use it to our own ends, if we take care not to take those elements too far afield from their original context. The goal is not to synthesize the two thinkers, Cheka writes, because to do this, quote, would risk overlooking all the ways in which what is being added as a supplement is already present in the thinker who's supposed to be lacking or deficient. In Nietzsche's words, quote, the worst readers are those who proceed like plundering soldiers. They pick up a few things they can use, soil and confuse the rest, and blaspheme the whole, end quote. But while Nietzsche cautions against clumsy, selective reading, he also offers us insight into how we might treat the works of previous thinkers. Quote, The philosopher supposes that the value of his philosophy lies in the whole, in the structure. But posterity finds its value in the stone which he used for building, and which is used many more times after that for building. Better. Thus, it finds the value in the fact that that the structure can be destroyed and nevertheless retains value as building material. While these two aphorisms seem at first glance to be opposed, they are in fact harmonious. We can, and more to the point should, be at once attentive readers of our source material and disabuse ourselves of the notion that we need to swallow a given philosophical system whole without criticizing its fundamental concepts or jettisoning outdated or useless baggage, which might otherwise be held up as axiomatic. This is exactly how scientific thought develops, through error, attentive reassessment, and looking at the world through new eyes. In light of this, I would like to draw attention to a particular reading of Marx associated with the French philosopher Louis Althusser, which draws a hard distinction and epistemic break between the character of Marx's youthful writings and those of his mature works. To greatly simplify this interpretation, it holds that the young Marx was a humanist, his writing still inflected with much of the idealism of his Hegelian intellectual heritage, and that the elder Marx was more scientific, having intensively studied political economy in the intervening years. While there is some truth to this, I am of the opinion that these differences are exaggerated, I have no doubt that Marx changed his opinions as he grew older, as we all do if we are actively engaged in learning about the world around us. I think there is overall more continuity than major breaks in Marx's thought. This epistemic break interpretation was perhaps more relevant at the time that Althusser made this intervention, but I think for newly budding communists in the 21st century, this reading does more to obscure than to clarify our study of Marx. I bring this up because Cheka tends to emphasize Marx's more humanistic writings throughout the book. And I do not think this is necessarily a bad thing, but it does color the overall political timbre of the text, so it is worth noting. I suspect, though I do not wish to put words in Cheka's mouth, that this book is intended as a polemic against the Althusserian reading of Marx, one that sees this reading as turgid and antiquated. I am inferring this from the content of Cheka's videos, which talk a lot about post-structuralist ideas. And since Althusser was a structuralist, it makes sense that Cheka would be coming from a perspective informed by this broad pedigree of thinkers. I say none of this to necessarily disagree with Cheka directly, merely to clarify where I think he's coming from. Now 
that we have a pretty good idea of what Shaker's mission statement for this book is, let's have a closer look at some of the key ideas presented in it. Given that Nietzsche was openly something of an elitist, and moreover, given his open disdain for what he called socialism, it might come across as a surprise that Nietzsche and Marx have anything in common with one another with regard to this topic. However, as Cheka points out, while Nietzsche held with a far more elitist outlook than Marx did, their criticism of certain kinds of what in their time was called socialism overlapped significantly. For example, Chapter 3 of the Communist Manifesto explicitly criticizes several contemporary forms of so-called socialism, namely feudal socialism, petty bourgeois socialism, and conservative or bourgeois socialism. Since this commonality between Nietzsche and Marx is probably the most unfamiliar, I feel it is appropriate to quote at length here from Cheka's book. Cheka argues, quote, Nietzsche's familiarity with socialism came largely through his acquaintance with Richard Wagner, who is associated with the politics of Proudhon and Bakunin, as well as, above all, his reading of Eugen Dröhring. Wagner, Proudhon, Bakunin, and Dröhring were all notoriously anti-Semitic, which makes it likely that anti-Semitism, which Nietzsche famously despised, was associated with socialism in his mind, as it sometimes was in his writings. Nietzsche sometimes attacked socialism as being a harmful expression of the ascetic ideal, that is, the ideal of denying the self. The ascetic ideal arises and gains influence because the weak seek out a meaning for their suffering. To suffer is bearable, to suffer meaninglessly is not. Nietzsche's equation of socialism with asceticism makes sense if we look back at the early history of socialism before the rising predominance of Marxism. As Marx and Engels write in the Communist Manifesto, the first theories of socialism accompanying the early stages of capitalism were necessarily reactionary. They inculcated universal asceticism and social leveling in its crudest form. End quote. Nietzsche, as Cheka points out, was strongly critical of morality, specifically meaning the pious codes of social control emanating from the Christian church. Among other components of this criticism, Nietzsche was particularly keen to declaim the asceticism of the Christian faith, and he saw socialism as merely another incarnation of this pious, self-denying philosophy. Both thinkers looked carefully at macro-historical forces that were causing sweeping changes in the world around them. The lasting impact of their thought is a credit to the depth of their study. Cheka notes that, while neither Marx nor Nietzsche were right about every prediction they made, they correctly identified lasting tendencies of modernity, which have retained their overall salience even if their more granular predictions did not come to pass. He writes, quote, Marx predicted that, so long as capital exists, it will accumulate indefinitely, falling into an increasingly smaller number of hands, and correspondingly, an endless growth in productivity will soar side by side with an ever-growing wealth inequality. Nietzsche predicted that the continued leveling of humanity into a faceless mass, the loss of any sense of greatness, and the corresponding degeneration of culture into the lowest common denominator. A crucial advantage they had over other thinkers of the time is that they recognized their respective objects of analysis as historically situated, rather than manifested through eternal laws, rather than a static collection of facts to be laid out. Marx historicized the economic categories that classical economists treated as eternal, and Nietzsche historicized the moral-slash-psychological categories that were treated as eternal by moral philosophers and theologians. End quote. This quotation leads us quite naturally to the next topic of Marx and Nietzsche as historical thinkers. It's no secret that Marx had a massive influence on later historical thinkers, but Nietzsche also had a profound impact on thinkers like Michel Foucault and many others. While it would be a stretch to equate Nietzsche's concept of genealogy to Marx's historical materialism, after reading this book, I am convinced that they have a great deal more in common than I initially thought. A caricature of historical materialism would say that societies evolve in a linear manner through different stages, one after another. 
But a careful reading of Marx, Engels, and later thinkers in the tradition of historical materialism reveal this to be the superficial caricature that it is. We nonetheless need to confront the fact that among many, this caricature still passes for quote-unquote Marxism, whether they be celebrants or critics of the tradition. Historical materialism done right stresses historical specificity in understanding a given society's inner workings. Retroactively assigning historical quote-unquote stages might be a useful heuristic for categorizing those specific iterations of a society's evolution, but it would be wrong to assert that they were somehow quote, inevitable. Nietzschean genealogy, on the other hand, draws its social historical metaphors from more natural sciences, as the name might suggest, whereas Marx's dialectical and historical materialism is much more indebted to Hegelian philosophy. As an aside, Marx and Engels were themselves very scientifically literate for men of their time, but that's a story for another day. See my video that I did with John Litkrit Guy on the dialectics of nature. All of this is related to another important philosophical feature that Marx and Nietzsche share, the notion of becoming rather than being. This distinction separates thinkers like Marx and Nietzsche from the likes of Plato. The philosophy of being is one that sees what is as static and eternal. Becoming, on the other hand, sees what is and what is not as fundamentally intertwined. In other words, the only constant is change. Cheka notes that for Nietzsche, the hammer of philosophy was likewise both this positive and negative instrument of change. The power to at once create, as in to use a hammer to build, and to destroy, to use a hammer to smash. He writes, quote, The hammer sounds out the status quo to determine its value and its expiration date, and once the value has expired, begins to hammer it through active critique and critical activity, building up the creator's vision using the materials provided by the ruins of the very idols one is destroying. Any successful socialist revolution must destroy only insofar as it reveals the beauty disguised underneath capital and the forces of production as created. So the working class wields a hammer too. End quote. As we can see, Cheka consistently points out throughout the book that Marx and Nietzsche are both highly attentive to change and teasing out how and why change happens. This is already getting pretty long for a book review, so I'm going to break off here and just give my concluding thoughts. While the anti-Soviet sentiment expressed throughout the book that I mentioned earlier in my review definitely left something of a bad taste in my mouth, this book was a thoroughly enjoyable and educational experience. I left the book with a far greater understanding of both Marx's and Nietzsche's ideas, and with a newly formed curiosity to check out Nietzsche's own writings. One theme that stuck out to me in reading the book is that every reading and rereading of an author changes the meaning of the original text to a certain extent. Every quotation, every recontextualization is an act of both creation and destruction, breathing life into dead words and uncovering new truths about the world in doing so. With thinkers like Marx especially, whose ideas were, and still are, considered dangerous to the powers that be, we ought to be very attentive to the way in which we interpret secondary texts. Many so-called Marxists, particularly in the Western world, have tried to water down Marx's writings and make him seem like a harmless political philosopher rather than a revolutionary whose thoughts sparked countless movements for political overthrow. Or, on the other hand, they have turned Marxism into a turgid dogma, vacated of the creative spirit that once gave it life. It is important that we read Marx, or any other thinker for that matter, for ourselves, and be wary of the credentialed so-called experts who interpret them for us. This is not to say that such interpretations have no value whatsoever, but we should at the very least take care to question their assumptions and interpretations by doing the work ourselves. I'd highly recommend picking up How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle and see for yourself what it has to offer. If this review was helpful to you, make sure to like the video, subscribe to my channel, and leave a comment below giving your thoughts. It would be very helpful to me if you shared a link to this video on whatever social media platforms you're on. 
If you'd like to support A World to Win financially, head over to patreon.com slash a world to win, where you can contribute as little as a dollar a month to help me reach more people with the educational content I provide here. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.